All right, this is going to be Chapter 12, the Cardiovascular System, uh, the Heart, Part 2. And in this section, we're going to talk about the heartbeat and how that actually occurs with contractile cells, a conduction system. We're going to talk about defibrillation, uh, the electrocardiogram, emergency cardiac care, and the cardiac cycle. Uh, the heartbeat, the heart contracts, the heart contractions is a coordinated in a coordinated manner, manner, and the upper and lower chambers contract opposing one another. And let me kind of show you this here at this point. So the atria contract this way, and they superfill the ventricles, and then the ventricles, whenever they start to contract, they contract the opposite direction. Now what this does is, is this will collapse these AV valves that are here and it will either pump it into the pulmonary trunk or out to the body. Contractile cells. <clears throat> action potentials in the cardiac muscle cells have a longer duration and contraction. The action potentials has three steps and this is the actual electrical movement through the muscle tissue itself. In step one, rapid depolarization and we have sodium movement in step one. In step two, the plateau, calcium elongates the contraction and calcium is essential in cardiac contraction. Not only does it initiate it or start it before step one, it's what starts the sodium potassium pump and the movement of electrons <clears throat> uh, or electrolytes in and outside of the cell, but it also elongates the contraction and provides better muscle contraction out of the actual myocardium. And then in step three, repolarization of the calcium channels closes potassium, rushes out, and restores the resting potential. Now, we essentially get an influx and an outflux of potassium, sodium, and calcium. Um, so here we go on this down here, we're right here. And this is the actual contraction, it's already been initiated, so calcium actually kicked it off about right here. And then we get an influx in sodium, which causes the electricity or the voltage to change in the cell. And this causes the muscle cells to contract, phase one. And then we get an, an efflux or a movement of potassium, which it's mostly on the inside of the cell, to the outside of the cell. Now, during phase two, we get an influx of calcium and sodium, and we normalize through the sodium potassium pump at the end of this. Now, in the middle here, to keep up the contraction, to, so we have amp, a good amount of amplitude and contraction during this, this phase, we get an influx of calcium into this whole environment. Now, what the calcium is going to do is it's going to create a better contraction than it would by itself. So calcium is essential in cardiac contraction. Uh, the conduction system. Conduction system is a network of special cardiac cells that initiate and distribute electrical impulses. <clears throat> we have nodal cells and they're responsible for establishing the rate of cardiac contraction. And there's two of them. There's a sinoatrial and the atrioventricular nodes. And then we have conducting cells. And this distributes the contraction stimulus to the general myocardium, and this is what kind of spreads it around and about the, the actual heart. And then we have pacemaker cells, and this is, establishes the normal rate of the heart. And so all of these different types of cells are actually working and functioning and every time, every time that the heart beats. The conduction system continued. The sinoatrial node uh, gives us a rate of about 70 to 80 beats per minute. Now the normal variances is what is in the parentheses here. So the sinoatrial node will run 60 to 100 beats per minute. The atrioventricular node, or the AV node, will run at a rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. The AV bundle uh, continues the conduction system into the left and right bundle branches. The left bundle branch supplies the left ventricle with stimulus, has two fascicles, which is an anterior and a posterior branch, and the right bundle branch supplies the right ventricle with the stimulus, and it only has one fascicle. And then we have Purkinje fibers, and they convey the stimulus to the vent ventricles of the myocardium. So I'm going to blank this out and kind of talk over this again. All right, so we actually have the heart here. 
and in the heart it has four chambers, two atria and two ventricle. And uh, we're going to draw the conduction system here. So this little node in this section is a sinoatrial node. And then we have a node in this section called the atrioventricular node. And from the AV node, we have the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch. And the, since the left heart is bigger, we actually have an anterior fascicle and a posterior fascicle. <clears throat> now, what happens is, is these are our pacemaker cells here. Now, what they do is this one's running 60 to 100 beats per minute, and this one is running 40 to 60 beats per minute. So when the sinoatrial node fires, it fires and causes the atria to contract. This contraction wave comes down and it actually hits the AV node, which is the next pacemaker site. And, the, and this will allow the continuance of that electrical stimulus. And it will travel into the right and left bundle branches. Since the left heart is bigger, it requires two fascicles and the right heart isn't as big, it only requires one fascicle. Now, once it gets down to the very ends of these things, it goes into something called the Purkinje system, which are little hair-like substances that will pretty much transmit the electrical stimulus into the myocardium. So these are very, very tiny, same way on this side, Purkinje fibers. So again, sinoatrial node fires, Stimulus comes down, hits the AV node. The atria now have contracted. Blood is in the ventricles. This whole area here is sheathed, which means the contraction doesn't start till it hits the apex. Once it makes it to the apex, it turns and contracts the ventricles, which will either put it into the pulmonary trunk or out to the body. The conduction system continued. Uh, if we see somebody that's bradycardic, it means that their heart rate is below 60 beats per minute. And if we see somebody that's tachycardic, it means that their heart rate is above 100 beats per minute. Ectopic pacemaker, action potential which completely bypasses the normal conduction system. And again, whenever we talk about the conduction system, we're talking about the sinoatrial node, AV nodes. So anybody that has ever heard of a premature ventricular complex or a PVC, a PVC is an ectopic pacemaker site. It just initiated in the ventricular muscle. Premature ventricular complex. So here we have it in step one. Sinoatrial node fires. In step two, uh, stimulus spreads across the surface of the of the atrial surfaces so all of this stimulus is going to transfer across the atria and the atria are going to contract step three there is a hundred millisecond delay at the AV node atrial contraction begins so all of this information got transmitted to the muscle tissue in the atria and now we have the atrial muscle starting to contract and starting to superfill the ventricles the stimulus also at the same time hits here it's moving very rapidly, so it'll not start contraction until it gets down into the Purkinje system down here. So step four, the impulse travels along the interventricular septum within the AV bundle. So now the electrical stimulus is here, and now it gets transmitted to the Purkinje system, which allows the heart or the ventricles to start contracting in this direction. So we have two contractions opposing one another that are occurring in the heart every 60 to 100 beats per minute. Clinical notes on defibrillation. Uh, the first defibrillators weighed about 40 pounds a pop and with um, de increased development in battery life and smaller batteries and more efficient machines and we now have defibrillators today that are fairly small uh, inner intra-automatic uh, cardioverter defibrillator, an IACD. Uh, these used to be quite large uh, whenever they placed them in the patient's chest, and now they're about the size <clears throat> of a uh, small Copenhagen can, about a, a quarter of the actual thickness. They're very thin, very efficient. 
Uh, we also have AEDs nowadays that are very, very small. Um, some AEDs are about the size of a tablet. Um, joules, this is what the actual defibrillator delivers the energy in. And there's a point to this. Joules equals amperes times ohms times second. Now, a joule is one watt for one watt second. So the question is, is the highest joule setting that we use is 360 joules. Now the question is, is does it take 360 seconds to deliver that energy? And the answer is, is no, it does not. So they take that amount of energy and they compress it down into a millisecond delivery and they deliver it. You never want to touch the patient <coughs> whenever they are getting joules delivered to them. <coughs> there is a lot of energy left over from um, the defibrillation and it will find the best ground. If you are the best ground, then it, that's where the electricity will go into. The electrocardiogram. Uh, electrocardiogram is a recording of electrical events and these are pretty much the waves that we see in the electrocardiogram. The P wave <clears throat> pretty much signifies atrial depolarization and the QRS complex is the depolarization of the ventricles. The T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. Uh, cardiac arrhythmias are abnormal patterns of cardiac activity. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. So let's go back up here to the P wave again. P waves are atrial depolarization. And what that means is, is that the atria are actually contracting. So every time we see this word depolarization, it means contraction. And the QRS complex, depolarization of the ventricles, means the contraction of the ventricles. So whenever we find the QRS, this is going to be uh, the actual contraction of the ventricles. Whenever we find the P wave, this is going to be the contraction of the atria. And the T wave, because this has to all reset and do it again, is the repolarization of the ventricles. So this, this section right here is what got blowed up. And this is what we're looking at right here. So the P wave um, is the atrial depolarization. So this is the atrias right here. Um, that P wave spreads across, and this is about the spot that it hits the AV node, which is here. And then we get the QRS complex. This is this area here, the QRS complex, is ventricular depolarization or the actual ventricles contracting. And then the T wave, which is this at the end, isn't any contraction, but it's the muscle cells resetting themselves so that they can do this all again. Clinical note emergency cardiac care. Um, as far as emergency cardiac care, we need to recognize early warning systems of a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, and we need to provide immediately base, um, immediate basic life support, and then as soon as possible, do something that I like to refer to as an ALS bridge, provide immediate advanced life support if necessary, and then transfer of stabilized patients. So we need to get these patients to a facility to where they can actually fix the problem that is occurring. An uh, example of this is if they're having a heart attack would be cath lab. The cardiac cycle. The period between the start of one heartbeat and the start of the next is called the cardiac cycle. And we have two phases of this. Systole is the contraction phase and diastole is the relaxation phase. So whenever we refer to these terms, systole being the contraction and diastole being relaxation. And that also refers to that, just to put a note here, as far as blood pressure. Your systolic blood pressure is the highest point of blood pressure, and that would also be the point that contraction has just occurred. The diastolic blood pressure would be the relaxation or the lowest point. So between the two numbers, that's where we get blood pressure. Um, it says to start here, but I'm actually going to start about here. So during diastole, or whenever the ventricles are relaxing, and that's, that is E and F here, and this is figure 2.21 in your book, what we get is we get something called passive filling. And what that means is, is all of our valves are kind of open, and it's filling into our ventricles. Everything's kind of relaxed still. 
the AV valves open up and allow more passive filling to occur in the ventricles. This is whenever the cardiac cycle starts or the SA node fires, and what's going to occur is, is the atria are going to contract. Now what this does is this kind of super fills the ventricles for a second. This is also 30% of our overall cardiac output in what is called an atrial kick. During atrial systole ends, atrial diastole begins, and now the stretch kind of provides a little bit of back pressure, which collapses these AV valves, and the electrical stimulus actually gets to the apex, and it starts contracting in this direction. And this will contract until the pressure is enough to pop open the semilunar valve and either go into the lungs or out to the body. Heart sounds. Uh, heart sounds, we, when we hear them or we put a stethoscope on there, they kind of sound like a lub-dub. The first lub is the AV valves closed. And the first dub after that is the semi-lunar valves closed. <clears throat> so we can't actually hear them open, but we can sure hear them close. Um, if we hear swishing sounds after any of those, this could possibly be a regurgitation. So these are called S1 and S2. And the first heart sound, which is a lub, is pretty much the AV valves or the atrioventricular valve snapping shut. And this is going to be in between the atria and the ventricles. So these here, this is S1. And then our semilunar valves, S2, second heart, the second heart sound is a dub. The first dub is a semilunar valves closing. And what we're hearing is after lub dub, we're hearing the semilunar valves in either the pulmonary artery or the aorta closing. Heart dynamics. Factors that control cardiac output, blunt myocardial injury, the denervated heart, extracellular ions, temperature, and cardiac output. Heart dynamics, and this is a cardiac output formula. Stroke volume is the amount ejected by a ventricle during a single beat. So this is the amount of blood that is ejected out of the left ventricle to the body in one single beat. The cardiac output formula is as follows. Cardiac output is going to equal stroke volume times heart rate. Now in that stroke volume equation, the three things that we talked about earlier all apply. Does the person have enough heart rate? It definitely applies this to cardiac output. Do they have enough contractile force strength to contract the heart well enough? And do they have adequate peripheral vascular resistance in the system? And the fluid, if you'll remember, was somewhere in between. So there has to be adequate fluid for all of these three things essentially to work on and make cardiac output. But the cardiac output put formula proper is essentially stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. Factors that control cardiac output, blood volume reflexes, and these are regulated so that tissues receive adequate blood supply. After contraction, returning to a pre-contracted length is provided by blood rushing into the heart. And we notice this during diastole of the ventricles, that a passive filling actually occurs. Atrial reflex produces adjustments in the heart rate in response to venous return. So if the blood isn't getting enough venous return, then one of the signals that's going to go out hormonally is please beat harder and faster. And then venous return, flow of the venous blood into the heart, and this is going to come in on the right atrial side. Filling time, duration of the of ventricular diastole. So the longer that the ventricles can have diastole, the better that they fill. And last but not least, and we're going to talk about this principle a lot in shock, is called Frank Starling's principle. We're also going to talk about this a lot in cardiac. Frank Starling's principle simply states, stretching something to a certain point provides a greater output. Now I'll give you an example of this. If you have a rubber band and you're stretching it to a certain point, you're going to have a greater output. However, after that certain point, you're going to stretch it beyond its means. So it'll lose some of its elasticity. It may not be able to fire what you would like it to fire out of there if you're using it as a, as like a beanie flip or a rubber band um, spit watch shooter. 
So in either case, Frank Starling's principle states that this only works to a certain point. After that certain point, you start to lose exponentially um, the amount of output that you actually have. Auto autonomic innervation. Uh, the heart is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, when coming into contact with postganglia, post will increase both beta-1 and beta-2 responses. Now what that means is, is this refers back to what we talked about in the nervous system, is we have paired and unpaired. If a, we have a paired version, that means we have a pre and a post. In the autonomic nervous system, sometimes we don't have the pre, so we identify what type of innervation is occurring by what it accepts on the post side. If it's going to accept epinephrine and norepinephrine, then it is an autonomic or an adrenergic uh, ganglion. Now, the beta-1 and beta-2 responses, beta-1 is contractile force and heart rate. Beta-2 is smooth muscle dilation. Now, the point on these two, smooth muscle dilation would open up your bronchial tubes to where you can have more air coming in, and the beta-1 would make your heart beat harder and faster. Effects on heart rate, um, epinephrine and norepinephrine increase effects on the heart rate whenever this occurs is epinephrine and norepinephrine in increase, and acetylcholine decreases the rate. So if we fire off epi and norepi, what we're going to get is the heart rate to pretty much increase. If we fire off acetylcholine, heart rate is going to decrease. Effects on stroke volume. Epinephrine and norepinephrine increase force of contraction and stroke volume, and that's because of their direct effect on these beta-1 and beta-2 receptor sites. So they're going to make the heart beat harder, faster, and stronger. Autonomic innervation continued. Coordination of autonomic activity. The cardiac centers in the medulla oblongata control autonomic uh, headquarters for the cardiac control. Stimulation of the cardioaccelerator center activates sympathetic motor neurons. So heart rate goes up, sympathetic motor neurons are activated. Stimulation for the cardiac inhibitor center activates parasympathetic motor neurons. So very simply, we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Oops, I put an R, I meant to put a P. And this is going to slow the heart. And this is going to increase heart rate. So if we increase sympathetic stimulus, this kind of works like a teeter-totter. This will actually go down and stop any or most of the signaling to slow down the heart rate. Vice versa, if we increase parasympathetic tone, we get the sympathetic system to kind of shut down and, and stop what it's doing. So it works just like a teeter-totter. We use this teeter-totter a lot. Uh, we use it quite a bit whenever we're um, treating patients with asthma or cardiac problems to where we need to get more out of the pump. Autonomic innervation continued, and we just talked about that, my apologies. So this is figure 12.22. And this is the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node in the heart. And these are where sympathetic innervation is actually occurring. And then this here is parasympathetic innervation. So we get more stimulus on this side, heart rate decreases. We get more stimulus on this side, heart rate increases. Clinical note, blunt myocardial injury. Um, myocardial contusions can lead to ST segment changes. We identify the heart being damaged uh, from the changes that we see to the ST segment. The ST segment, P, Q, R, S, T, is this section right here. Now why that's important is, is all electrical activity should be done. But if we still see some elevation or the, the myocardial tissues holding electricity when none should be there, 
we could identify this section as being injured. So myocardial contusions can give us ST segment changes or mimic, um, give us signs and symptoms of someone actually having a heart attack when they're not. Myocardial edema would be swe swelling to the actual myocardial tissue itself. Pericardial tamponade, you have a pericardium around the heart. Bleeding in between there and the myocardial tissue would reduce the size of the heart, could actually um, take on blood or uh, get larger or use Frank Starling's law, which would stretch it to a certain point. And then commodio cordis here, which we can throw a patient into ventricular fibrillation, uh, must strike the myocardium in the area just before the peaking T wave. So this is called an R on T phenomena. P, Q, R, S, T. This right here, from this area to here, this is the absolute refractory period. Now what this means is, is the heart can't receive any stimulus in this time frame because it's already committed. It goes back to that theory all or none uh, that we learned in the muscle chapter. <clears throat> However, this area here, after the T wave has halfway repolarized, this area, if the stimulus was strong enough, could give us or take over pacemaker sites essentially in the heart. So this is called an R on T phenomenon whenever this occurs. This also occurs in commotio cordis. Um, example of this would be a soccer ball moving at 200 miles an hour, hit someone in the chest in just the right frame. Uh, that's one of the reasons why sporting events actually have automated external defibrillators now, or the coaches should have access to an AED, both for the pediatric and the adult versions. Clinical note, the denervated heart. And a denervated heart occurs from a heart transplant. Number one, the parasympathetic nerve is cut and cannot be reattached. So resulting in a resting heart rate that is faster than normal, uh, controlled by natural sympathetic hormones or endogenous catecholamines. And the epinephrine, norepinephrine, whenever we consider them in the body, Another word for them is endogenous, my own homebrew catecholamines or adrenergic hormones. Clinical note, extracellular ions, temperature, and cardiac output. And hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia. So how essential was calcium in the cardiac cycle? and it was very essential. If we have too much hypercalcemia, the heart can actually become extremely excitable. This can be problematic. It can throw us into VTAC or VFib. Hypocalcemia, contractions are weak and may cease altogether. Without adequate amounts of calcium, uh, the heart will not beat. Uh, hyperkalemia, contractions become weak and irregular. And how the actual muscle cells make the action potential occur is through a sodium potassium pump movement. So if there's too much potassium on the outside of that cell or you're in a hyperkalemic state, the heart may not function or they may, be, they may become weaker than they normally should be. Hypokalemia, uh, heart rate's reduced. If there's not enough potassium there to begin with, then you don't have the ability to generate an action potential. Uh, terms we should know out of this section. An AV valve, and these are pretty much in between the atria and the ventricles. These areas right here. Atrium, which is this up here, the atrium. Cardiac cycle. And the cardiac cycle was the one to where we looked at it, ventricular diastole, the heart fills, fills more whenever the ventricles open, atrial kick occurs, or the atria superfill the ventricles, then the ventricles superfilled, the AV valve shut, 
and they fire in the opposite direction. Cardiac output. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Diastole, which is relaxation. Electrocardiogram, or ECG, and this is the electrical movement, um, the movement of electricity through the heart, and this is what we would refer to as a contraction. Endocardium, which would be the inside. Epicardium, which would be the outside. Intercalated discs. This is what allows the heart to pond skip or make contraction occur in regions. Myocardium, which is the actual muscle cell of the heart, the actual muscle tissue. Pericardium, which would be the sac surrounding the myocardium. Purkinje fibers, and these would be down low in the actual ventricles. And this is after the AV node, right, left bundle branches, anterior fascicle, posterior fascicle. And those Purkinje fibers would transmit the electrical stimulus to the myocardial tissue. Uh, sinoatrial node, again. Sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node. Systole, which is contraction. And then the ventricles, which are right here. This concludes part two. If you have any questions about the heart, feel free to contact me, 405-219-7613, or you can contact me at smithart.net. Thank you.